right, why don't you turn to Acts chapter uh, 16, and um, again, I encourage you to, uh, before we jump in the Word, just to continue to pray for uh, uh, Israel, and um, there's, um, you have to kind of uh, look for uh, valid uh, sources uh, to, uh, to find out really what's going over there sometimes, and um, uh, keep in mind that um, CNN, CNN International is owned almost 90% by Saudi Arabia businessmen, so they have just a slight, a uh, little bit of a, a bend when it comes to news reporting in the, in the Middle East, and you have to kind of look for some other sources again. And I've put a lot of uh, interviews and things uh, uh, on our, our Facebook page. A uh, very good interview with uh, Prime, Min Prime Minister Netanyahu yesterday, uh, really extolling the support from the United States of America that he's had from Congress, from the President, the, uh, what it's meant to have the Iron Dome system, the $250 million just appropriated to them to kind of beef up that Iron Dome system, and uh, very appreciative of that, and then went on to explain some, uh, some other things that they're, they're dealing with, uh, with ha uh, Hamas. Uh, also, I encourage you, if you haven't seen, uh, the person we refer to as the son of Hamas, and I can't think of his, uh, his uh, full name, last name is Yosef, and he was here at one of our conferences, uh, at Calvary Honolulu just uh, a few years ago. Father, one of the founders of Hamas, and uh, he's been uh, interviewed several times. It makes it very clear that Hamas has very little to do with the Palestinian people. Hamas is there as an uh, ideologue. They have their jihadists. They, uh, they want to uh, drive Israel into the sea and kill as many Jews and Christians as they possibly uh, can. They pretty much hijack the, uh, the Palestinian people uh, and will use them uh, for any means necessary to their end. For example, uh, some of their own sources have reported, have, you've heard about it, hopefully have seen how sophisticated these tunnels were. Uh, they had 160 kids died digging these tunnels. Uh, there's been seven ceasefires uh, in order for aid to get into the Palestinian people, in order to get critically wounded out and into Israeli, Israeli hospitals where they care for them. Uh, but Hamas has broken every one of those uh, ceasefires. And then the last one was through uh, uh, only about an hour and 45 minutes into the ceasefire. Uh, they uh, ambushed some uh, ADF soldiers, three were killed, many were injured. Uh, and you probably heard about the one soldier that they were afraid was uh, uh, captured and kidnapped at one point in time. And then it turned out uh, a few days later that he was actually killed in, uh, in combat. But uh, uh, not always the most uh, accurate reporting Palestinians, of course, uh, the only way they can win is to show uh, children that, that have uh, injured or died on television uh, to try to play upon uh, the good nature uh, and the good hearts of people that live in democracies, uh, of course, not realizing that uh, often they are using these kids as uh, human shields and really could care uh, very less about them. Uh, anyway, so it's a difficult situation for Israel. I encourage you to keep them uh, in their administration and your prayers. All right, well, we're in Acts uh, chapter 16, uh, titled The Message the Gospel Arrives in, uh, in Europe. I could have uh, easily uh, entitled it uh, Attitude is, uh, is Everything. And certainly we can, uh, you've probably experienced uh, uh, things enough in your own life to realize that when you have the right attitude, uh, even in very difficult circumstances, it makes all the difference uh, uh, in the world. Uh, and apparently it's possible for us to change our attitudes, because I hear moms say that all the time. You change your attitude right now, do you hear me? I don't know if you've ever heard that. I've heard that phrase a few times, continue to hear it. So it's possible apparently to change our attitudes, or good mothers would never say that, of course. And, uh, and God is interested in our attitude. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, has had uh, certainly a, a difficulty in the second missionary journey. How did it start? With a pretty major fight that uh, uh, that might have almost come to blows with his best friend over the issue of whether they should take John Mark or not. We, uh, we looked at, uh, uh, at uh, that last week as uh, Paul and Silas uh, head out. Uh, Paul is not able to go into southern Turkey where he wanted to go. He's prevented some way, circumstantially, by the Holy Spirit from going there. He wants to go then and turn north and head towards the Black Sea and some uh, very major cities that are up there at the time. That's what he wants to do. He's trying to get the gospel out. He's trying to do the right thing. But apparently the Holy Spirit also circumstantially prevented him from being able to do that. And he ends up moving westward uh, in the city of Troas. So he's in western Turkey, 
Uh, that's where uh, Luke has now joined him. Uh, Timothy joined him in Lystra. Uh, so there's four of them. Paul has uh, what we call the Macedonian call. He has a vision at night. A man from Macedonia is calling, please come help us. And again, Macedonia would be present day Turkey or northern, excuse me, Greece or northern Greece. Uh, and, uh, and he does go and, uh, and join him there. I'm not sure if I think I might have a, did I, go ahead, yeah, I did leave a map. So you can kind of see his journeys. They leave Antioch. We've already uh, picked up right in the center there, Lystra. She's got very good eyesight. You can see that. But basically that huge area in the middle and the, uh, and the purple, that is all present day uh, Turkey and where they're going to go, where it says Macedonia, top left corner, that is actually northern Greece. And that's where they make the, uh, the jump uh, and go over. But uh, Paul's response and his attitude certainly are, uh, are very important, something we want to uh, learn about uh, from, from here. I, um, I want to give you a, an example of when I had a good attitude. What about the bad ones? Ah, we don't want to mention those. But uh, uh, it, it is just interesting, I, and I, I don't have the time, but uh, I, I was just uh, telling the folks in the first service, I can remember taking the kids on mission trips, and you're tired, you're fatigued, and then you love that when your flight is delayed an hour, and then it's delayed another hour, and then it's delayed <laughs> another hour, and then it's delayed another hour. And, uh, and so uh, now we're, we're leaving uh, Narita, Japan, and we're flying, and we're going to get to Hong Kong about 2 o'clock in the morning when there is no transportation available, and we've got 16 people to get to our hotels. Attitude is just not the best. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, but God worked it out anyway. Uh, there was a trip a couple of years later, uh, again, with the youth group, and we're uh, going to uh, take Bibles to the house church uh, in China, in China, and, um, and, uh, and we got caught. It was, the, uh, it was the first time. We flew into a major city in southern China, and um, that's a little discouraging. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, you saw a lot of Zippy's chili to get there, and you just kind of hate to get caught. And once you, once you go through uh, customs and, uh, and immigration, and... Um, you know, but, but I have to say at that time, uh, I did have a sense that, you know, if <laughs> this is a long ways for all of us to come, and we have a lot of Bibles. There was a revival going on in that particular city. They didn't even want teaching materials and some of the other things. They just wanted Bibles because there were so many new believers. And, uh, and we got caught. Everything was confiscated and, um, uh, and everything. And, I, and then we end up on, on the curb and our missionary that we travel with. Uh, did not get caught, neither did his wife, and now the Chinese guys that were coming to pick us up have already taken them to our hotel, which I have no idea where that is. And we're way outside the city, and I have no idea how we're going to get there. Fortunately, I remembered on the itinerary the, the name of the hotel, Yuan. <laughs> uh, same, same last name as uh, Leonard of uh, Moraine. At least that was one Chinese word I could say. And... Uh, uh, but we're out there, and it was just like I'm telling, telling the kids, this would be a good time to think good thoughts because I can't really use the word prayer because now we're, we're surrounded by people that are listening to our every word because uh, we've just had all our materials confiscated. And uh, I just remember praying, and, but just having this, you know, this, like, well, Lord, <laughs> this is a long ways to come and do all this. You've got to have, a, this is too weird. You've got to have a reason for this. So I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of open here, <laughs> however you might lead, because they didn't have any other options. You know, God sometimes does that to us. You know, I just had this real impression by the Lord to go talk to this one guy. I happened to notice he was loading uh, tourists and people on, on buses, and we're like the only holly, so that's part of the problem. I mean, this is, there's nobody that uh, is going to speak uh, English in this airport. <clears throat> and I go to this guy, and I don't remember because um, the, my ability to say no ice in Mandarin is not going to help me at this juncture. I got a, I got a hello, a thank you, and no ice, please. That's the extent of my Mandarin. And I think any of these things going to help me. But uh, I went over and I just said the name of the hotel. It was just uh, felt like that's what the Holy Spirit was telling me to do. So I'll just do that. And uh, and then he looked, and then he looked at uh, all the, and then I pointed to this large group of people standing on the curb, and he's like, he kind of gives me the, the wait. Okay, go back, what are we doing? We're waiting, you know. Within five minutes, this guy comes back again and gives me the follow me, and we go around through the parking lot, around a hedge, and here's a shuttle bus to our hotel that we didn't even know existed. <clears throat> Jump on the bus and we, and we go there. And it was, um, 
You know, it was just interesting to me because I there are many times when you're traveling or other circumstances you don't have the best attitude, uh, and it's amazing. I could have had a horrible attitude then. God probably would have gotten us to, but instead, I was just well. That's what Paul's able to do here. In some very adverse circumstances, he's able to kind of stay focused and. Whatever, whatever seems like it's happening to me, and they're going to end up in prison, uh, there is still the assumption by him that God's still on the throne, that God's sovereign, God's got reasons and purposes for uh, anything that they're going through. Uh, his response is uh, amazing, uh, something we can learn this morning. Well, let's look at the first convert, and that's verse 11 uh, to 15. Therefore, sailing, again, we're in Acts 16, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So <clears throat> the setting for this uh, conversion kind of gave you the lowdown on the, the map. Let me show you what Philippi looks like. Though. <coughs> Beautiful place. That's, that's Philippi today. That's the uh, ruins from the, uh, the amphitheater. Uh, that is there. Uh, again, this is northern Greece. And go on to the next slide. Uh, very extensive ruins. The marketplace is there that they get drug into. Uh, you've got the approximate place where Lydia was uh, baptized. Beautiful river uh, there just uh, outside the, the city. But uh, again, this is a, a journey that they've made of 150 miles. They, uh, they've made it in a couple of days because as he uses that, uh, that phrase, uh, we ran a straight course, is actually a nautical term. It means, term, it means the wind uh, is at our back. Uh, we'll note on the return trip, it takes them uh, five days. But uh, Philippi is a, is a Roman colony. So they land at Neapolis. There's still a little, little town there called by a different name. They walk uh, eight miles. The road that Paul walked on, again, is still there uh, and still uh, intact. And uh, they arrive in a, a Roman colony. Uh, and that becomes a, a very important thing in terms of our story because Paul and Silas, of course, are both uh, Roman citizens. It seems to be part of Paul's M.O., certainly to go to major cities, and if there was a Roman colony, he would go there. Why? Because, well, as a Roman citizen, he had all the rights and privileges, as did all Roman citizens. Living in that, that city would be the same as if you lived in Rome. Rome established these Roman colonies. They would kind of cut deals with uh, uh, retiring military officers often giving them homes or properties in, in these areas to try to spread out uh, their influence and their culture uh, to the worlds that they had uh, conquered. Uh, and that was true of, again, it's Philippi, but we say Philippi. Uh, and uh, as they do that, <coughs> Paul uh, also uh, would enjoy the benefit of no taxes. If you were willing to live uh, in one of these colonies, you would have no taxes. That's not a bad idea. If you establish a few of those, there might be a few people move there. How about Molokai? No taxes. There might be a few people move over there. But uh, for Paul, so he could move there. He literally was a tent maker, uh, earned his own way, working hard, uh, and he could enjoy the benefit of being a Roman citizen. It becomes an important part in our city, part of the setting. And then Lydia, the first convert uh, in Europe. Uh, there's apparently not enough of a Jewish population in this city. In order to have a synagogue, you needed at least 10 men uh, or more to build a synagogue. And so what they would do uh, as Jews is they would meet outside the city, uh, usually a place of, uh, of clean, uh, fresh water. So Paul uh, realizes there's no synagogue, so he intentionally goes out, goes by the river, figure if there's any Jews in the city, he's going to find them there on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath. Uh, and he does. Uh, he finds this group, uh, group of people meeting. And he meets Lydia, who very, is a very successful uh, businesswoman from Thyatira, uh, known for their purple dyes. Uh, and apparently, again, a Roman colony. She's able to move back and forth freely between these two cities and conduct commerce. She owns a home, which was very unusual. So again, uh, she's very, very successful at what she does. 
Uh, she is a Gentile who's become a worshiper of God. She's become a proselyte uh, to Judaism. Uh, and here it says, and the Lord opened her uh, to the gospel. Uh, the term there in verse 14, in the second half, where it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Spoken just means conversation. Paul's just having a conversation with her. He's not preaching the gospel. There's not a crowd of people that's uh, gathered there. Uh, he's just sharing with whoever might uh, be there. Her heart was open. She uh, accepted the truth. And she becomes now the first convert uh, in, uh, in Europe, which is certainly uh, significant. In terms of uh, some things that uh, we can apply to our own lives, as Paul, the great evangelist, evangelist here, uh, we see him do a couple of important things. He went to people that would be open to the gospel. That's why he always went to the Jews first. They're monotheistic. They believe in one God. He can appeal to the scriptures. Uh, Jesus uh, fulfilled prophecy. He is their Messiah and so forth. And he'll continue to do that. If you want to lead people to faith in Jesus Christ, it's kind of a good idea to go to people that are open <laughs> to the gospel. And I know that we, we, we share with and we pray for people that aren't because they're, they're related to us. They're our friends. They're our family. They're our neighbors. And we care about them. And they may not be very open to the gospel, but hey, man, we just keep praying and keep doing what we can to, uh, to uh, help them see uh, the truth uh, of the gospel. Uh, but at the same time, while we're doing that, and that's a good thing, it's not a bad thing to think, hey, is, is there some other people around here uh, that are a little more open to the gospel that I can share with as well? And uh, a friend of mine that's a pastor uh, shared with me this story that uh, he had a guy in his church that was frustrated because he worked on an assembly line and for several years kept sharing uh, with one of his buddies on that assembly line as, as they work. The guy was never open to the gospel at all. This went on for a couple of years. So uh, he finally told him, well, <laughs> what about the other guy? There's got to be two guys next to you on the assembly. What about the other guy? Oh, no, we're not even the same age. We don't have the same likes. Uh, uh, we don't have the same interest. I, I don't even know the guy. Well, try. Why don't you try? True story. He goes back and, and realizes that uh, he never really uh, talked to this guy very much, he, you know, other than a hi, how's it going? Uh, he starts to uh, share with him a little bit, and the guy says, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. I, I've been listening to you, uh, you know, talk to so-and-so over there, and, you know, the whole thing about the Bible and some of the things you were saying about prophecy and who Jesus is, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Could we meet sometime? I've got some questions. Two weeks later, the guy receives the Lord, and eventually those two guys start a Bible study there, uh, there in that plant. Uh, but uh, it helps to, to go to people uh, that are open to, to the gospel. And I started thinking about that. That's probably different for all of us. But it's something to consider and something to pray about. Uh, sometimes we're, we're almost blinded uh, to people that are open to the gospel because we're so focused on, again, people that we love and, and we care about. I just thought if, uh, if you want to be involved in evangelism and, and leading people to faith in Christ, uh, it might be good to go to people that are open to it. And I can tell you one group of people that are really open. It's not a mystery. Kids. Kids are really open. You want to lead people to the Lord? Get involved in Sunday school. They lead people, the kids to the Lord. They're very open to the gospel. I mean, there's just one example. I mean, there's people all around us that have drug, alcohol problems. Not all of them. Some of them are really open to the gospel. They're desperate. That's how I came to the Lord. I was just desperate. No one led me to the Lord, so I just got on my knees and prayed. Yeah. I led me to the Lord, uh, you know, because I was desperate, uh, and I wanted to be delivered from, from a drug addiction and a horrible lifestyle. Uh, there's people that are out there that are pretty open, people that have uh, broken marriages, uh, kids that uh, are uh, they're kind of throwing their hands up with and, uh, and so forth, have broken relationships. There's hurting people all around us. Many of them are very open to the gospel. Paul made sure he went to a group of people that he thought would be open to the gospel. And of course, once he's there, he challenges them with the truth of the gospel and gives them an opportunity to respond. And we'll see him do this uh, many times, but the first convert in Europe is established. So we could say, uh, the man from Macedonia turned out to be a woman. <laughs> the vision is the man calling when he gets there. The first person he leads to faith in Christ uh, is uh, Lydia. Uh, secondly, uh, we should expect what would happen next uh, because of that. Set, Satan brings a coordinated attack uh, against the gospel, and that's in verse 16 to 24. Now it happened as we went to prayer 
that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her master as much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, when the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So uh, the reason we're seeing it's a coordinated attack because it begins with deception. Uh, that doesn't work, so then you've got outright uh, persecution with Paul mm -hmm. and Silas. Uh, but the deception begins with this, uh, this young gal, uh, basically, who bas is really saying the truth about them. Uh, verse 16, she's got a, a spirit of divination who met us. Uh, she's making profit for her uh, fortune tellers. Spirit of divination in the uh, original Greek has had a spirit, and it's had a Pythian spirit, as in Python, as in a snake. Uh, again, according to the, uh, the Chronicles of Delphi, uh, Apollos, the, the demigod, uh, would take the form of a snake, uh, then he would speak uh, his voice, uh, often through the voice of a young slave girl. So that's exactly what you've got going here. Uh, so the people hearing her speak and doing the fortune telling were assuming that they were hearing from the demigod uh, Apollos. In reality, it was a demon that was controlling this gal. And even though what she was saying was true, Paul was going to have nothing to do with it. He did not want the gospel of Jesus Christ breaking forth brand new. Nobody's ever heard it before here uh, in the, on the European continent and somehow having it associated with a demon and with, with Satan. We could say he doesn't want to be sponsored by Satan. Uh, you can imagine sometimes uh, if you watch... Uh, uh, guys uh, in, uh, or gals uh, running races and so forth, if they have sponsors, uh, the logo of those uh, uh, sponsors will be on their jerseys very often. Uh, I know that the, uh, the guys who play on the PGA get uh, a great deal of money from their sponsors. It might say Titleist or whatever it says, First Insurance on their hats. Uh, and they get paid for each of those. They're associated with them. Uh, you wouldn't want to go out as an evangelist with your evangelistic jersey on and over here, maybe you've got the logo of Calvary Chapel Windward. And over here, you've got the, the logo of some known Bible college. And over here, you've got the logo of Satan. That, that just wouldn't go, that would seem right to you. It wouldn't seem right to me. And that's what Paul is uh, saying here. Yeah, what she's saying is true on this occasion. Uh, but she know, he knows the demon is saying it for the purpose of deception. To align this demon-possessed gal with them and with the gospel so later to deceive. Sometimes we say that um, a broken clock is right twice a day, but we still wouldn't want to use it to tell time. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of people out there that will name the name of Christ, stand in a pulpit, stand in a church, use Christian terminology, but they're not telling you the truth all the time. They're telling you the truth some of the time, uh, but they're not going to tell you the truth all the time. And the only way we can tell the difference is if we listen to what they say and we measure what they say by the plumb line of God's word. We hear what they say. We hold up God's truth next to it to tell whether we're being deceived or not. Uh, and again, this is the same thing with the demons and Jesus uh, period of time as well. G Jesus would walk up. Somebody would be uh, demon uh, possessed. And very often the demon would speak out and say something about don't harm us. You know, most high God, they would make reference to uh, Jesus' deity or whatever, and Jesus would immediately uh, silence them. So again, here's an attempt. It's a coordinated attack against the gospel, uh, and it's going to be done through, uh, through Satan via this young gal who's been uh, demon-possessed. Uh, we could call her owner spiritual pimps. 
who basically sold uh, this ability for her to fortune tell uh, and tell the future and so forth uh, to, uh, to others, and now they've lost that uh, ability. Uh, verse 19, but when her master saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. And, uh, and again, could she tell, tell the, the truth? Could she actually predict things in the future? No, but Satan uh, certainly can speak through demons and tell people intimate details about their past. Uh, and that lid, lends legitimacy then to things that they might say uh, in, in the future. These things are, of course, all, all on the rise in, in our own country. And, and uh, uh, television, we joke about them. It's part of our vernacular and, uh, and, so, and so forth. It's pretty bad when a, when a guy on ESPN is, uh, is at a, a calling a sports event and makes reference to the quarterback able to channel some other famous quarterback. And everybody knows what, what's, what is he even talking about. You know, 25 years ago, he's channeling. It's like, what, what, what's that? And uh, uh, well, that's when a person has a demon in them and they're able to channel and have them speak through them. And now we're using that as a sports commentary. It's become pretty commonplace uh, in the culture. But Paul cast out the demon. Uh, that ends their ability to profit from this, uh, this young gal. Again, Paul didn't want either the gospel or the name of God to be promoted uh, by one of Satan's uh, servants. So because of that, then the, quote, coordinated attack uh, becomes outward. Verse 19, the second half, they seized Paul and Silas, uh, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our, our city. Now, part of what they're saying is true. I'm sure they were bringing a lot of trouble to the city through the gospel. Also, there was the issue of the fact that they notice he says, and they are Jews and we are Romans. Within the Roman Empire, Judaism was a, a, a legal religion to not be persecuted within the Roman Empire structure. They were tolerated as, as a religion. And one of the reasons that, uh, that Luke, that Dr. Luke writes the book of Acts is to bring the association that we've already seen uh, that uh, Christianity comes out of Judaism. It is a sect, it is a part of Judaism. If Judaism is legal in the Roman Empire, then Christianity should be legal as well. That's part of his big, big overview argument that he's making. He's going to conclude that in our story, in our narrative, by putting, uh, having Paul be on trial on several occasions. Each time he's found innocent, innocent, innocent. There should not be persecution against us. Judaism is legal. Uh, we should not be persecuted by the Roman authorities. Anyway, that's, that's part of the purpose of the writing that we covered in the overview of the book. But, but it was illegal for Jews to proselytize Roman citizens. So that's what, that's what he's making the case. That's his charge. Uh, they're Jews, we're Romans. These guys are trying to proselytize us. Therefore, they should be charged with a crime. Now the magistrates, there's, uh, there's more than one, there's two, it's plural. Uh, they don't even wait to uh, basically uh, give them a trial, hear what they have to say. They're gonna kind of regret that later, of course. Uh, they just immediately have these guys stripped and then uh, beaten with rods. Paul is beaten with rods on three occasions, this being one of them uh, here, uh, and it was, uh, it was brutal. Their backs would have been uh, laid open uh, bare. Uh, the, uh, their clothing would have dried into their wounds, uh, and of course, uh, then they are delivered uh, to the, uh, the jailer there who's going to have a very interesting experience with him as well. But uh, again, uh, it's uh, the first convent in, in Europe is because of Paul's attitude and his obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. As a result, the gospel gets planted there on the continent. What happens next should be expected by any of us when we're do, doing something for the Lord. There's going to be some pushback. And it might be in terms of an attempt to compromise the gospel, infiltrate the gospel, be, be deceived by others who uh, purport to be Christians who are really, uh, really not. Uh, and if that doesn't work, if we hold to the truth of the word of God, then Satan can come with the full assault uh, in terms of persecution uh, as well, which he continues to do, of course, uh, around the world. And we're witnessing part of that uh, uh, in the Middle East today. Thirdly, Paul and Silas make a choice that lead to, uh, we'd say, an earth-shaking moment. But at midnight, we're in verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. 
and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword uh, and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, uh, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. So the conversion of the Philippian jailer. Again, but it begins with Paul and Silas making a choice to, uh, to worship the Lord Verse 25 again. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The word and is not uh, in the text. Uh, they, were, they were singing their prayers is literally what, what they were doing. Uh, I don't know why they chose midnight. I got a feeling they were uh, not able to sleep well that night, being beat to a pulp. And then their legs, which would be wide and extended into the stocks, a very uh, uncomfortable position meant to bring pain whether you'd been beaten before or not. And, uh, and what they do, again, they are singing their prayers. That's what really worship is. When we come in, Mark leading us, and uh, uh, we're really not doing Christian karaoke. Uh, we're not just like, I know that tune, and uh, there are the words. Let's all sing, you know. Uh, actually, it's meant to be a prayer. Those lyrics, those words, are an expression, we believe, we're saying, of our hearts to the Lord and praise and, uh, and worship to Him. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's going on with Paul and Silas here. But we certainly have to ask the question, how in the world could they sing uh, and worship God at a time like this? Beaten to a pulp, locked in the stocks. I would say the one that they remembered the purposes of God. Paul in the gospel and his companions uh, were able to sing because they knew for sure that God had called them uh, to take the gospel into the world. Uh, they knew that God had directed them through the Macedonian call of that man and that vision and the circumstances leading up to it. They were where they were supposed to be at the time they were supposed mm -hmm. to be. And if they found themselves in a prison now, it's because God wanted them in a prison now. If they were found themselves in a prison with their backs beaten, it's because God wanted them there in that condition for some reason. They didn't know what it was. They didn't understand what it was. I'm not sure if there was any questioning going on, but at some point in time, uh, they determined they are going to uh, worship the Lord and try the best they could to give him glory. They remembered the purposes of God. They were secondly relying upon the power of God. If God wanted them out of the prison, he would get them out of the prison. Uh, he, had, he had released uh, Peter from prison by a miraculous means. They would be well aware of that. He had not released Stephen or James. They were both martyred for the faith, and maybe that would be their, their fate at this juncture as well. Either way, they're okay trusting with what God had for them. Charles Spurgeon once said, It's an easy thing to sing when we can read the notes by daylight. But the skillful singer is he who can sing when there is not a ray of light to be read. Songs in the night come only from God. They are not in the power of men. They're not in the power of men. They're only by the power of God. Uh, but we have to rely upon that power. And to really come into that power, well, it's a lot has to do with our attitude. You know, we, we have to change our attitude in certain circumstances. And I don't know if God's the, the Holy Spirit comes into your little ears like your mother used to do and tell you to change your attitude right now. But sometimes he probably does in one way or another. The prophet Habakkuk, probably one of the classic verses about having the right attitude and worshiping the Lord, is found in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. It is a horrible time in Israel. Uh, the, the people have turned away from God. God is now raining down his just punishment on them as a result of it and things aren't well for the prophet but he says this though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit 
though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Uh, he's saying, that even though, by the way, we have no food, uh, we have no sheep, we have no cattle, uh, we got nothing going for us, but I'm going to make a decision right here and now, change my attitude, and I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. We, we can always, we can always all do that, always. Uh, it's just a decision, a choice that we have. Uh, but uh, but Paul uh, and Silas both, they're both saying, they're both doing this. They're both recognizing and trusting the, the sovereignty of God, <clears throat> that he allows things to happen to us that he might be glorified. Uh, it was because he needed to get Paul and Silas into this prison that he has them arrested. Why? So that they could sing praise songs in the middle of the night. Why? Because we see in verse 25, the other prisoners would be listening. Why? Because then when an earthquake hits, none of them run away. Why? Because he wanted the jailer to cry out for help. Why? Because he was trying to build a church in Europe. Why? So that from Europe, the gospel would come to America. Why? So that a young Hawaiian named Henry Opakahi, with tears in his eyes, would receive the gospel on the East Shores. He would write his memoirs down. Other people would read that, and they would leave, and they would come here and preach the gospel. Why? So young Hawaiians would leave Hawaii and go throughout the South Pacific preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? For his glory. God works in difficult circumstances, and sometimes it's the most powerful work that he does if, if we change our attitude, if we're able to trust him. Paul didn't know exactly what God was going to do or what the outcome would be. I don't think he had any idea, but he knew God and the nature of God and the heart of God enough to know that he's not letting us get beat up for no reason because he'd already been beat up one other time and left out the city of, of Lystra. And a young, young teenager named Timothy watched all of that and came to faith in Christ. And he becomes one of the great leaders of the, uh, of the early church. If we respond properly to difficult circumstances, there will always be opportunities for God to be glorified. Does that make us God's puppets? No, it makes us his partners. He allows us to partner with him in the ministry of the gospel. And then Paul is able to take charge of the situation. Again, we would say this is, uh, as one writer said, Europe's uh, first sacred music concert, and it brought the house down. <laughs> uh, and then the, the jailer, this is kind of a classic, calls for a light, he runs in, he falls down trembling before Paul and Silas, uh, and, uh, uh, and says the classic line, what must I do, do to be saved? Uh, you know, again, he, uh, he, he would have been executed. For, for these prisoners, if they had escaped, uh, he would have been tortured uh, and then executed. Uh, keep in mind, he's a pretty gnarly guy. He probably looked like he was from Duck Dynasty or Hell's Angels, one of, one of the two, because uh, it wasn't exactly the upper crust of society that was a jailer in those days. Pretty much the jailer had to be tougher than the guys that were in jail. And uh, sometimes that's still true, true today. But uh, this guy, uh, very humbled by all of this, uh, when he's, and really when he says, what must I do to do to be saved. I don't even know if he's thinking about salvation or God or anything else. He's just thinking that, uh, uh, man, I owe you guys my life uh, because you've kept these prisoners here and I don't understand what's going on. But, uh, uh, but Paul jumps in, uh, gives him a wonderful two-hour discourse on the distinction between Calvinism and Arminianism. <laughs> no, actually, he didn't do that. He just very simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Probably everybody in your household when they hear what I got to say to them. Okay. That was, a, that was a very short presentation of the gospel right there. Sometimes that's all it takes. That's what it took for the guy that built this pulpit. He was a uh, gunny uh, out here, uh, third radio battalion, and God had been working uh, in, in his heart. Uh, every, everywhere he went, he was uh, a recruiter before he came here. He'd find himself uh, driving across the country. He'd go through the radio dial, driving in the middle of the night. And the only, the only radio station he could find was, at that time, Calvary Satellite Network. And he'd have to listen to these Calvary Chapel guys teach the Bible. And it happened over and over again. The only radio station he could find was Calvary Satellite Network. <laughs> and he finally said, all right, Lord, I'm, 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 the next, I'm PCSing. I'm going to my next duty station. I, there was no internet in those days. I'm going to look in the yellow pages. And if there's a Calvary Chapel in that town, then I'm going to attend it. And, uh, and he did. And after the service, came forward and said, 
He actually said this, what must I do to be saved? I'm pretty sure that was almost his exact words. And uh, I was a little shocked. I wasn't sure exactly what he, what he meant. I didn't jump right in and go, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it only took about two minutes to figure out that he was sincerely uh, wanting to uh, surrender his life to the Lord, be forgiven of his sins. And uh, he'd heard it through the radio ministries uh, over and over again for several months, and he was, he was ready. Uh, the Philippian jailer was ready. And Paul doesn't mince any words here. Just very simple. Uh, how can a person be saved? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul covers that very succinctly, of course, in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified. It's with the mouth that you confess uh, and are saved. And, uh, and apparently Paul has the opportunity then to preach to the rest of his household. And they all come to faith uh, in Christ as well. The fourth thing here is... Uh, now the citizenship of Paul and Silas become a factor uh, here uh, in this uh, city, verse 35 to 40. Uh, and when it was day, the magistrates sent officers. Officers is the term for the guys that beat them. So the guys that beat them now show up saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul. I wonder how that went. You can let them go. Uh, they're up at my house. Uh, I'll go because he would live upstairs above the prison. I'll, I'll go up and uh, let them know. I don't know if they were confused over that or not. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, "The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace." But Paul said to them, "They have beaten us openly, un uncondemned Romans. Romans with a capital R mean we're Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison." And now they have put us out. Uh, now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. Probably served them coffee or tea or something as well. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had uh, seen the brethren, they encouraged them uh, and, uh, and departed. Just a couple of words on this. Paul informs the magistrates uh, of the citizenship. Uh, these guys are, are appointed by Rome. Uh, and they could have been executed for what they did. It was against the law to arrest, <coughs> beat, or imprison a Roman citizen without a trial. And that's exactly what they've done. It's not like they lose their pension. Uh, it's, they, they could be executed. If Paul went to the authorities over their head, uh, they, were, they were in big trouble. They might have tried to defend themselves. They might have got some false witness. But either way, they, they were in a lot, of, a lot of trouble. Paul and Silas had a few scars on their back. It's uh, pretty good evidence of what had transpired there. Uh, and so these guys are shaking uh, in, in their boots. So Paul says, uh, no, you better go tell them we're citizens. And by the way, I, I want a public very open public escort by these magistrates out of prison. Uh, I want people to know that we've done nothing wrong. I don't want any person in this city to fear sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want them to know that these magistrates will do nothing to them. Uh, secondly, he, uh, he uh, leaves and goes to, to Lydia's house and encourages the church. Again, what's the point there? He wanted the magistrates to know that... Uh, Remember me, I hold your life in my hands. These are my friends right over here. They're going to be having a little church over in here. And uh, you certainly won't be bothering them, will you? Uh, and it, uh, uh, what they were willing to go through in terms of this beating and the imprisonment basically safeguarded Lydia's home as a place for the church to meet. It safeguarded the believers in this town in terms of any kind of retribution or persecution that might come towards them in the future. Basically, the magistrates in this city would become their protectors uh, because of what they had done to the Apostle Paul uh, and, uh, and Silas. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's amazing what God can do uh, when we're willing to go through some difficulty and respond with the, with the right, right attitude. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to tell you this real fast. So on that trip, when we got ready to leave that particular city, and we had to go back to customs. Uh, our plan was uh, uh, to leave all the materials, and there was a lot. Uh, they had stored everything in cardboard boxes, give me a little receipt. Uh, we got followed everywhere in the city. We could have no contact with believers. Uh, we got ready to leave, and 
<laughs> they got uh, a couple of the guys and uh, took them off to uh, customs to, to go pick up uh, all the materials. And the whole time, from the beginning to the end, they had a young gal, <laughs> she was probably 22, 23 years old. Uh, she was a customs worker and the English major spoke very good English. And the whole time, uh, from the very beginning, she's saying, tell everyone, don't worry, don't worry, everything's gonna be all right. Uh, we chatted a little bit. She seemed, uh, for, for a Chinese official, she was over the top uh, nice, which I, I took to be, uh, well, this is the, the grace of God here. So when they left and she was there with me, I knew I had about four or five minutes to kind of share with her. And I, I just, I, I said, you know, I believe the reason that we got caught is so that I can have a conversation with you. And it's a very important conversation because I believe that you know in your heart that there is a God and that God exists. I went through some very quick apologetics with her about intelligent design, uh, and, uh, and she, she was kind of tearing up, and I just said, you know, that Jesus Christ, and, you know, he died for our sins. I gave her the gospel uh, very, very quickly, uh, and I asked her, have you ever heard this message before? And she said, yes, I have. My mother's a Christian, but my father is a very high official in the Communist Party, and I don't know what to do. <coughs> you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You need to trust him. You know, he can bring in a little thing. said, hey, we're going to, we're going to, I believe it's the reason we came to this city. I believe it's the reason God allowed us to get caught with these materials. And we're going to be praying for you. And I'm going to ask all these people on, on the team with us to be praying for you as, uh, as well. Maybe we'll see her one day in heaven. But sometimes you get a little glimpse that, oh, now, now I see there really was a reason. There really was a purpose. Sometimes we'll have to wait to heaven uh, to get that reason or that purpose. Uh, but God allows us to go through difficulty for his glory if, if we'll have the right attitude as we go through it. Quite a Christian, the Apostle Paul and, and Silas. What a church, huh? You've got the Duck Dynasty guys from the jail, and you've got this very successful uh, uh, <laughs> businesswoman and the church starting with these two very diverse families. Class, classic New Testament church here. And... Uh, and uh, you want to have some fun? Go read what Paul says to them later in his letter. Got, got a great, great, great heart for this, uh, this group of people. Now I praise you, Lord of all creation. You are
Houston.